when do you think Jesus Christ will return? That question was posed to a group of young adults. You guys can think about it. Let it roll around in your heads for a little bit. Five years? Ten years? Twenty years? Thirty years? How much longer do you think the world can go on as it is? I remember thinking as a little kid, really young, when we leave and we all have to go to the place of safety, which stuffed animal I'm going to, am I going to bring with me? Then I was older and I was like, man, as, as, a teenager, as, as a teenager I was wondering, am I going to be able to be baptized? What's going to happen? Am I kind of like in limbo there because I'm not a baptized member, so I'm not going to be a spirit being? What is going to happen? And then, will I be married? And then, you know, will we have kids? And then, how old are those kids? And it just keeps going, right? But time keeps marching on. It's interesting, the individual that posed that question to us at a, a young adult's camp out a few weeks ago said, the answer depends on how old you are. The younger you are, the farther off you tend to think it is. Now that may be different for different people, but how real is it to you? Let's turn over to Mark chapter 13. Kind of starts to answer this question, when will Christ return? Mark 13, 32. If you have headings in your Bible, this is the shortest sermon ever. Because it tells you. No one knows the day or the hour. Let's pack up, let's go home. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. It says, But of that day, speaking of when Christ will return, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, being Jesus Christ, but only the Father. Take heed. Watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And we don't know when it is. No one does. A lot of people try to guess. A lot of people look at the Mayan calendar. Well, are they correct? No, they were wrong. You know, There have been people that have revised their statements, and you can try the prophets, and if their prophecies are true, you know, God, the Bible tells us, try them, test them, see what's going on. There was one individual a couple years back that started off, it was, it was ending in the spring, and then it was the fall, and then it was, well, I have to, you know, I have to do some more study, and that, it, it changes, right? And sometimes we can get caught up in trying to figure out when it is. There's an interesting um, snippet that um, UCG does, or BT dailies of these little five-minute Clips. It's actually almost exactly a year ago. It was on July 5th. They had It was called, What Does It Mean to Watch? And they go over this scripture, and they break it down into three things. So we're going to read through in verse 33 and 34 um, to get at those three, and we're going to want to cover those. Um, keep you on your toes, because I'm not going to tell you what those three things are yet. But verse 33 says, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Verse 35, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And I say to you, and what I say to you, I say to you all, watch. B.T. Daly broke it down into three things. Watch, pray, work. Watch, pray, and work. Another interesting article, actually, in the Good News, um, almost on the exact same topic. You, you want to talk about the inspiration of God having two things multiple years apart. Um, a year earlier, a year and a half earlier, there's an article in Good News called, Jesus' Warning to Watch, Just What Did He Mean? And in that article, Mr. Don Hooser breaks it down and he says, Take heed, watch, pray, and work. So you have one extra. You actually have to listen in order to be able to take heed the first time. But let's, let's look at those, watch, pray, and work today. Because, like I said, it's easy to watch. You have rubberneckers, you've got voyeurs. There's, everybody likes to watch and look. 
It's very easy to watch. It's a little bit different to do the other two uh, faithfully. Let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. It says, But concerning the times, the seasons, the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a, as a thief in the night. We just read that. You don't know when the Master is coming back. Um, there's another parable. You don't know when the thief is going to break into your house. If you did know, you'd have stayed up and waited and got him. Right? But we don't know. But he's saying, you know these things. You, the people that I'm talking to, the audience, we know this stuff. We know that Christ is going to come when we don't expect Him. Verse 3, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Even though we may not know exactly when he's coming back, we do have some, some clues and snippets that Christ goes through. He goes through the, the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, and he tells us, hey, look for these things. And he says, there are going to be other people that are going to be taken unawares, but I want you to be watchful. I want you to know. Verse 5, You are all sons of light and sons of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, because we know that we need to be looking, because we understand the signs and the times and we should be able to read them, because of that, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. That word watch is interesting. It's, uh, the Greek word is uh, gregoriuo. It's a mouthful. But it means to be vigilant, to be awake, to give strict attention to, or to be cautious of. The Good News article here I'm, I'm quoting says, When the New Testament commands us to watch in this scripture, it is, usually is a, it is usually the translation of one of two Greek words, uh, Gregorio or uh, Agrupneo, which have similar meanings. So you either have one is to stay vigilant, to stay awake, and the other one is to be sleepless. And they're usually meant in the metaphorical and spiritual sense, to be vigilant and on guard, fully awake, aware, alert, intently focused, with several applications and implications. He goes, the article goes on to say, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 to 40, Christ is, want, is speaking to His disciples, the three that are with Him, um, and it says, the meaning of watch is primarily physical. Jesus was chiding the disciples for not remaining awake during the hour pre preceding His arrest. Let's actually turn over there. We're going to read a little bit of that passage in Matthew 26. Uh, we'll start in verse 41. Matthew 26, verse 41. So he told them physically stay awake, which was one of the meanings. You know, to be sleepless, to be awake. And on the physical side, that's what he meant. How come you couldn't stay awake? But in Matthew 26, 41, he says, watch and pray after he chided them about falling asleep. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now that has nothing to do with sleeping physically. It has nothing to do with being tired physically, but it has everything to do with watching out spiritually. The article says, but what, what Jesus next said to Peter has a deeper spiritual meaning. Watch and pray, lest you enter in temp into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. You know, the intentions are there, that are good. But the flesh, mere human willpower, is weak. We can't do it on our own. We, we heard about that a lot in the first message. We like to do it a lot on our own. We like to do things on our own. Little kids like to tell you what they can do or what they can't do. Nope, I can do that. I can open the door. I can get my own food. I can brush my own teeth. And we don't lose that when we grow up. We just stop telling everyone. We just go and try to do it and internalize it. 
What we need is spiritual watching coupled with prayer, and that gives us the strength to, to survive the temptations and the difficult situations that we're going to face in this life. We need to be watchful. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verse 54. Because there's, throughout the Bible, when Christ is admonishing His followers at that time, and us here in the future, He's admonishing them to watch. There's a distinction between, well, you can take it on just the physical side. Okay, I know, I'm supposed to look for, you know, that three and a half years, I've got to look for the red heifer. I have to look for when the, when the, uh, Sacrifices are going to resume at the temple. I'm going to look for all these other things. You know what? A lot of people have lived and died and never seen those things start back up. And there's something about watching. There's something about making it real to us. While those things are important and we need to be able to discern the times, there's something else that we have to be watchful for, and that is that spiritual side of things, that we don't sleep. Verse 54 of Luke chapter 12. Then he, Christ, also said to the multitudes, Wherever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it is. Unless you live in Arizona, at which time you get no rain anyway. <laughs> and when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern the time? You can get so caught up in watching... You can get so caught up in trying to read every single prophecy that you're trying to figure out when Christ comes back that you missed the boat. And he's admonishing us, he's admonishing the individuals at the time not to miss the boat. We need to discern both the physical times and also where we lie spiritually. What is our spiritual health? What, what should we be focusing on? Because we know it's not just about prophecies. There's a lot more to God's way of life than that. Those things all hang on love and having the right mindset. You know, we do need to keep the commandments, but there are weightier matters as well that if you don't add them to obedience and keeping the commandments, you don't have it. Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 5, 8. A very uh, oft-quoted scripture when we're looking at what we're up against, what we need to be watching for. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, and be watchful, you know. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. There are man-eating lions out there in Africa, and they hunt people. It's a different thing to sit there and think that you might be hunted. If you've ever watched a nature show, they often talk about them, and it's a different thing to be hunted. And you feel that the red laser dot on your forehead. We have that. We have that. We have an adversary that's coming after us, and we're told to watch. You can't just look for them. You can't just look for them and say, oh, like we heard, I'm avoiding sin, I'm avoiding this. No, we have to strive for something else. And that leads us to the second point. Pray. Let's turn over to chapter, uh, chapter 21 of Luke. Because as I said at the beginning, watching is not enough. We can be rubberneckers. And we can just watch this opportunity, this blessing, the graciousness of God to call us out of this world. And we can just watch it zoom right by. Because we've missed what He's calling us to do. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. It says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Because you weren't watching. Verse 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. 
verse 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of, God, the Son of Man. We have to be not only watching, we have to be praying because you can't, we can't, I can't, no one can do it on their own. We have to have the indwelling of God's Spirit. We have to have His guidance because like a small child, we are, most of the time, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, have no idea what is best for us. We think we do. We'd like to go try it out, but it might bite us, it might shock us, it might whatever the case is. Insert tragic thing here. We have to make sure that we're watching, that we're not getting caught up in what is going on around us. We have to have that distinction between us and the world. I mean, you know, we're not pulled, we are not removed from the world. We're, we are called out of the world, but then Christ also prayed that God would keep us in the world. And there's a reason for that. Because you see what's going on around you. Character is built, the godly character is built by relying on Him and seeing that we need to have Him to help us to not be what he doesn't want us to be. So we're there, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And we need to make sure that we're not getting too caught up in it. We need to make sure that we're not letting our guard down and not watching anymore. We need to make sure that we have that relationship with him. We need to have incessant prayer. And if we're watching, and you look outside of ourselves a little bit, just on the news, you see that there are terrorists attacks all over the world. It doesn't matter if it's um, from any one specific religion. You're looking to see what people do to people. It's horrible. It's horrible. There are mass killings. You have wars, famine, drought, wildfires. It doesn't matter. It's, it's horrendous. And if that doesn't rent your heart and make you sit there and pray, Thy kingdom come, I don't know what will. I mean, you listen to the news and you get choked up and you get that lump in your throat because you're realizing there are people out there that are dealing with something that don't have the inner peace, that don't have access to that. And they hurt. You think you hurt when you hear it. They hurt. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, we're told to pray in the model prayer. Thy kingdom come. And if we love God, and we're really, truly striving and actively working on living His way of life, then that prayer, it should be an emotional prayer. Because He has called us out of that into His marvelous light to be able to experience something different, to be able to experience what He's wanting to bring to everybody. So we can watch the world around us, but it should incite a little bit of, a lot of bit of compassion for the world and to pray, not just, I mean, it's not about us saving our skin. And if it is, you're in the wrong place. Because if that is your end goal, I won't. Well, I don't think that the, the Bible supports, if that is your end goal, that you're going to be there. We'll just say that. You know, God wants sheep, and He wants people to want it because they want it for the right reasons. And that, reasons, that reason is because He wants to be able to expand His family. And he wants to be able to open it up. And He says, hey, you know, I'm calling you out of this world because I would like you to buy into this system of thought and belief. And so, again, that should change our thoughts. That should change how we look at things. That should change the intensity with which we watch and with which we seek to preserve what God has given us and the extent to which we fight against anything that is trying to take that away and to try to take that crown. First Thessalonians chapter 5. A little bit earlier in the chapter than where we were. I'm sorry, a little bit later in the chapter. First Thessalonians 5. Start in verse 17. After the, it's interesting, after the admonition of 
being watchful in verses 1 through 11 in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. He goes into his exhortations for the congregation on how to act and what to do to build each other up. And that's a whole other message all on its own. But he says here, it's, it's part of that in verse 17. Well, we'll go read verse 16 because of the first message. It says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. It's only through prayer and study and fasting that we can understand and know what to watch for. There are many people who have forgotten what to watch for. There are many people who can get caught up in the wrong thing to watch for. It's by God's graciousness that we understand what we do. And that we can look into the Bible and we can see the prophecies open before us. And that we can look into the world and see them happening. And then on top of that, that we can be shown what it is that we need to work on so that we can be there to even help Him. You know, so we need to have prayer as a very strong part of who we are as we are watching. The third aspect of watch, pray, and work is work. Mark chapter 13, 34. Mark 13, 34. There's a lot that we are called to do. Do is an action, and it's, it's, it's active. And here in, in verse 34... Of that parable, it says, It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each, to each his work. And he commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Our Master, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, gave us a job to do. He gave the Great Commission to the disciples, you know, to preach the gospel, to prepare a people. He told Peter to take care of his sheep to feed his lambs. There are a lot of very specific jobs that we know of. And we have all been given a very specific job as well. We heard about those last week, actually. To not put the bushel basket over our light and to let our light shine. But he's given us our own tasks to do. And a lot of them, a lot of them are the same and a lot of them are very different because we're all very different people. We're supposed to persevere and to overcome. And we all have different things to overcome. And we have pillars in the church that are over, you know, stalwart people in overcoming this and other people that are exceptional at overcoming that. And they're not all the same thing. But we're all called to work. And we're all called and given those tasks when we, when we agree to come out of this world and to, to accept His help in doing that. Turn over to John chapter 13. I think it's important to note when we're looking at what we're supposed to do to look at the example, the very direct example that was left for us. And here, this is the Passover night that Christ is with His disciples in John chapter 13. We'll pick it up in verse 12. Here's what He does. So when He had washed their feet, taken His garments and sat down again, He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example of what you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We're called to do that work that Christ gave us. We're called to be servants. Servants to each other. We're told to help those in the household of faith. We're also told to not be so myopic and to help those that are outside. Because, you know what? A room full of people with flashlights gets a little old after a while, doesn't help anyone. We're blinding each other or something like that. We're told to go put it on a hill. We're told to put it, the candle into the candlestick and be a light to the world. And we're supposed to serve them as Christ did. 
And he divested himself of greatness. He did so much. The example of his life and what, what it means for us, we can't even begin to scratch in our lifetimes on being able to really, really follow that. Another good passage for this is James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 14. Again, a familiar section here about faith and the actions that we're supposed to be doing. It says, What does it, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And if we're just sitting back, if we are passively here saying, Well, you know, I was baptized. I see this and I see how times are changing. You know, it's, it is rough for the world. And I'll tell you what, I am so happy that God called me out of this world and that I'm now here and I'm safe. We're not called to be stagnant people. We're called to be actively glorifying Him in all that we do. And can just having faith save Him? Verse 15, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself does not, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say to you, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This has to be something that we are all in. We heard about that in the first message. You have to be all in. It can't be something that you're testing the water and dipping your toe into and saying, well, maybe. No. Buy in. Because if you don't, there's no spot for you. That's just the short of it. There are sheep. There are goats. There are those who think that they're doing what is right, but don't have the heart to... You know, you can do a lot of things, but again, without the other two, the prayer and the watchfulness and... God's good graciousness and His heart, His hand turning your heart, our hearts, from stone into flesh, there's no way we can do it. But that being said, we do still have to be active. We do still have to act on our faith. Verse 19 says, You believe that there is one God and you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? This way of life should require, should light a fire in us that is so red hot that we can't help but rejoice. That we can't help but let the light that is within us shine. That we can't help but let the Holy Spirit that is coming in flow through us. Because if you just try to store it all for yourself, you're either going to explode or you end up stagnating because you get full and you can't take anymore and say, No thanks, I'm okay. My, my lamp is full. I'm done. It has to be constantly renewing. It has to be constantly flowing through us. We have to make sure that as we look forward, it's not about when Christ is going to return. To be honest, it doesn't matter. We want it to happen. But to be frank, He, he returns when we lose the breath of life. Now, that may be while we're young and maybe at His return, maybe when we turn spirit being, but it doesn't really matter. Because if we sit there and we keep saying, well, is it five years? Is it ten years? You know, I'm, I look at this and it is just, it's precarious. I think it's going to, I mean, maybe it's three and a half years from now. You know, maybe something happens tomorrow. Maybe something happened two years ago and we didn't know about it. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Because what he gives us, he gives us a job to do in the meantime. Because if we're doing our job in the meantime, the job that the master gave the servant then it doesn't matter when He returns because we're ready. Because we're all set. Let's turn back over to Matthew chapter 13. Or sorry, Mark chapter 13. I think there's a good summary here. It says, Take heed. Be careful. Be careful, because it's so easy to get caught up in the other things in our life, the cares of this world, 
the sins that easily snare us. There are so many verses and scriptures that come to mind. Just watch out. Take care. Watch and pray. Be close to God. Take note of what's going on around you. you know, don't forget that. But watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And if you don't know when the time is that He's coming, and you lose sight of the goal, there are other parables that say the servants started beating. The man started beating his servants. And that's when the master of the house came back and he called to account each one for the actions that they did. It all, it all ties in together when you look at the parables and you look at what Christ is telling us to do and admonishing us to do. He says, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. We have been given an awesome gift. And I don't mean awesome in the 1990s terminology of awesome. Whoa! No. I mean, you look at the Grand Canyon, you look at the height of the Sequoia, you see a humpback whale that's beside your boat, and you're like... And your jaw drops. It is awesome. You are in awe. You should be in awe. We should be blown away by what God has given us an opportunity to do. And it's not because we're wise or noble or mighty. It's because He wants us to be there in His family to help Him to grow His family. So He's given us this opportunity and we need to watch that we don't let anyone try to take our crown. We need to pray that we are there strong enough, close enough to Him, that we can be preserved. And we need to make sure that in the meantime, we're doing the work that He's given us to do.